Good evening. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming as we gather this evening to remember the life of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos bin Said. May he rest in peace. His Majesty ruled the Sultanate of Oman for 49 years and was responsible for the transformation of the country from an undeveloped nation to the thriving country we see today. We have several distinguished speakers here this evening who will share personal and professional experiences of His Majesty. Allow me to say a few brief remarks on one of His Majesty's many legacies, the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center. SQCC, as we are known, was established in 2005, and for our first eight years, we conducted limited programming and outreach activities. In 2013, His Majesty approved a plan to purchase a building for the center in Washington, allowing the center to greatly expand its outreach and programming. A colleague, of, a colleague in Oman told me that His Majesty personally approved the plans for the center and even went so far as to write comments in the margins of the proposal. As such, we were deeply touched by His Majesty's support and will remain ever grateful for the opportunity to shine a light on Oman and to share the extraordinary vibrancy of its culture and its people. The center will serve as a legacy of His Majesty's commitment to education and dialogue. Since moving to this building in 2014, the center has awarded 120 study abroad scholarships, 456 scholarships to study Arabic here in DC, and six research fellowships to academics to carry out research in the Sultanate. We've welcomed hundreds of students to SQCC each year, and thousands of visitors have attended lectures, poetry nights, cultural evenings, and other public events annually. These are just a few of the center's many accomplishments. It remains our hope that everyone we interact with will take a piece of Oman with them when they leave, having benefited from the generosity and vision of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos. With that, I would like to introduce Her Excellency Ambassador Hunaina al Muveri. Her Excellency has served as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Sultanate of Oman to the United States since 2005. She also serves as chair of the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center Board of Oversight. Her Excellency holds the distinction of being the first female Arab ambassador to the United States. An economist with an extensive business background, Her Excellency represented the Sultanate in negotiations for the U.S.-Oman Free Trade Agreement and is a tireless advocate for strong U.S.-Oman relations. Prior to her work in diplomacy, she served in many roles in Oman's Ministry of Commerce and the Omani Center for Investment Promotion and Export Development. Please welcome the ambassador. Thank you, Kathleen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. It's a pleasure and a great honor for me to have you here with us. Uh, this is a very sad time for us Omanis, but not only Omanis, but a lot of people who knew and respected His Majesty. His Majesty Sultan Qaboos, a dignified man who worked diligently for his country, an honorable man who worked discreetly with others, an extraordinary man who was a champion of peace. The story of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos is a modern story of our man. His Im impact was enormous. He put in a lot of effort to ensure the history and culture of his country were preserved and never forgotten. His emphasis on ensuring productive relationship with other countries did not go unnoticed and friends near and far could rely on him on matters involving diplomacy and peace. His Majesty Sultan Qaboos was entirely dedicated to his people and his loss will be shared not only by us Omanis, but by many who respected his wisdom and courage. We were all truly blessed to have him 
as a, and, uh, to have a man of His Majesty's caliber, integrity, and compassion. And Oman has become a major pillar of stability because of his leadership. Even in his death, His Majesty was as discreet as he was when he was alive, allowing for his people to mourn for him before others flow in to pay their respect. Watching the Omani people standing side by side on the roads as he, his fleet of cars drove him to his final resting place will forever be etched in my mind. His Majesty's leadership will be remembered whether it be his progressive ideas or foreign policy, the environment, education, and health, just to name a few. His compassion and great love for his people and country should be an inspiration for others. His love of music has introduced a sense of culture for the arts, for the current and future generation of our beloved Oman, and his tolerance of all faiths should be emulated by any leader in the world. Receiving visitors, a number of them at the embassy, to sign the condolence book was a testament to how much he was respected and loved. I received messages with tears. I watched people express their sorrow in writing, and I listened to the countless positive words about His Majesty that came from the heart. I am the result, or should I say the product, of His Majesty's belief and trust in the advancement of women. He saw the future in us and prepared us with a solid education as we embarked on our workforce journey to develop and build our nation while enjoying equal rights and opportunities along with our male colleagues. Despite Oman being a conservative society, he eloquently opened doors for us, our daughters and granddaughters, to prove ourselves socially, polit politically, economically, and culturally. Over 17th, the October 17th will, will forever be known as Omanis Women's Day because of him. As an Omani, I am proud to have given the opportunity to represent His Majesty and my country in the United States. I am proud to have educated my children and grandchildren under the guidance and foresight of His Majesty's wisdom. And I am proud to have experienced all this in peaceful and stable Oman. Sultan Qaboos was a pillar of tolerance, understanding, and progress during his reign. His leadership in the region and throughout the world should long serve as an example to those who are truly seeking peace and prosperity. The legacy that he has built will continue to live on. We lost a great man, one who knew the power of listening, who was a model of persevering the rich culture and tradition of Oman and who was a bridge between nations, one who was an inspiration to his genera generation and the future generation of Oman. May you rest in peace, Your Majesty. Your legacy will undoubtedly live on the hearts of your beloved people. You will be forever remembered as a promoter of culture, a man of peace and full of wisdom and tolerance. May His Majesty Sultan Haitham be granted the same strength and courage of purpose to carry on with your vision and prosperity. May we continue to rise as the great nation that he worked so hard to achieve. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ambassador Francis Cook. Ambassador Cook is a globalist with senior level government and corporate experience specializing in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. She comes from a 32-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, and in addition to serving as U.S. Ambassador to Oman, Burundi, and Cameroon, she served as U.S. Counsel 
general in Alexandria, Egypt. She was also tapped twice to be Deputy Secretary, Assistant Secretary of State. Ambassador Cook was the first female chief of mission in the Arab Gulf and the first female head of a post in the Middle East for the United States. During her tenure as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, Ambassador Cook was chair of the executive branch's interagency Gulf Security Working Group, which vetted and approved U.S. arms sales to the Arab Gulf, oversaw U.S. global security assistance and peacekeeping humanitarian deployments, and led executive branch teams to negotiate military accords abroad for the United States. She was liaison for the state, for state with the Department of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, frequently traveling with Dr. Perry, then Secretary of Defense. In 1999, she transitioned from her government career to the private sector, which has included service on the boards of major listed corporations in the United States and the United Kingdom, as well as chairing privately held companies in Europe, Africa, and the Arab Gulf. Currently, she is Senior Advisor, Strategic Development at Garda World Federal Services and a board member at Thea Satellite Systems. She also will share with us this evening um, her experiences as a close personal friend of His Majesty. Ambassador Cook, we are honored to have you. No, you were going to read that whole bio. That was embarrassing. I apologize. Good evening, everyone. It is a privilege again to be at this wonderful center, especially on this occasion to speak about a man so I so admire, Sultan Qaboos, a leader, a mentor, and I always like to think a friend. I plan to speak in more personal terms tonight and leave the heavy foreign policy lifting to Das Lender King and uh, Ambassador Shmir. I'll say a few things, though. You know me. Uh, I met Sultan Qaboos uh, for the first time in late 1995 when I presented my ambassadorial credentials to him. He was visibly pleased, making clear in his opening remarks that he understood that the Sultanate was being honored by America with the nomination of the first female ambassador to the Arab Gulf. That was, in fact, the case. His response to that honor is our hostess here today, as you've heard. The very respected Ambassador Hunaina, Hunaina was the, who was the first female ambassador to the United States, as you've heard. She is now historic, too. Maybe we can share Habib Dia Vitrine at the, at the Smithsonian one day. Okay. <laughs> he seemed to take particular care to spend a lot of time with me to teach me Oman and the region in a way that was unique, not only in Muscat, but in my life and diplomacy. I had countless lengthy solo meetings with him all over the country in the desert and in the cities and even in Europe, except when I brought him big US government or private sector delegations, which was an all hands on deck meeting. My tour there ended in 99, as I've said, but because of this friendship and many invitations to return by him, I kept my privileged access to him, which was rare in the Sultanate. He worked very, very long hours throughout his reign and spent little time on social events or even with most of his ministers, except in rather ceremonial meetings. He came to eschew the various GCC confabs, as we know, sending representatives after he also developed an aversion to air travel. He workaholic, micromanager, perfectionist, all fit. 18 hours a day was the norm in the early years. Several exhausted former aides told me. Caboos was born in a remote province in pre-oil Oman, in spite of its glorious history at the seat of a very vast empire on three continents, Oman was at a sad point then, had few kilometers of roads, almost no schools or graduates, only a couple of US missionary doctors for health care. They lived rather cut off from the world during that time. Many Omanis expatriated themselves and their children for jobs and education in those years. So Caboose, who was an only child, was sent abroad by his revered mother, a proud hill woman from the south to live with a very modest English family in a rural village. He stayed there for years, eventually attending Sandhurst, where he was an honors graduate, and many of his Sandhurst classmates retained the special access to HM after that and formed the core of the UK lobby that was never far. 
His awakening to the power of culture came during those childhood years in the UK. After his return from Europe, his mother protected him during prolonged house arrest in Salala, and then died tragically while he was out of the country. So during my time in Muscat, he developed a special fondness for my elderly mother, hosting her to rare dinners every time she came to Oman, usually on his birthday, which is Oman's national day in November. On one, one such occasion at his mother's palace in Salala, he told mom that he taught himself to play the organ in that little English village by sneaking through the church window at night and playing for many long hours until he figured it all out. My mother, who also played the piano and organ, uh, memorably that same evening, uh, spontaneously sat down at a grand uh, piano inside a Mazun's living room in Salala and played happy birthday to the Sultan, encouraging the four or five ministers who were often with him to sing. They did, I did, and so did HM. <laughs> mother, he stood right next to mother while she played and she told me that he has a lovely baritone voice. I should tell you he was also an accomplished Aoud player. The Sultan went on to establish not only the first symphony orchestra in the region, other states in the Gulf have since uh, emulated this accomplishment, but with European musicians. In Oman, of course, it's 100% Omani. And the various other musical ensembles from traditional Arabic to jazz, opening the wild, wide world of global culture to thousands of young Omanis. I was honored to be invited back to participate in HM's formal opening of Sultan Spectacular, Sultan Qaboos' Spectacular and internationally renowned Royal Opera House, as well as the second time for the first concert, same venue, when the best organists in Europe traveled to Muscat to place at the Opera House what is likely the finest pipe organ handmade in Germany on his orders in the world today. HM was also an amateur and self-taught architect, participated intensively in the design and multiple redesigns of probably the most spectacular new opera house in the world today. Arranged that, and he arranged that the first production of my favorite opera tour in Doe was conducted not only by Placido Domingo, but had an aging Franco Zafrelli, who was in a wheelchair by then as the director. This jewel of a building now hosts nightly both Arabic music and ensembles and the best Western artists and companies, all subsidized by the Royal Court. Culture matters in Oman. A word now about governance, a key building block of Kabus's vision of the new Oman. HM's first speech after being made Sultan, was in, in it he said he wanted to build a modern Oman, but one that was firmly rooted in the Oman's tradition and culture. Though he was self-taught in legal matters, he read broadly and knew where he wanted to take the absolute monarchy he had inherited. Working with a team of four lawyers, he drafted what became Oman's basic law, the first modern constitution in the Arab Gulf. If you take time to peruse it, it is no longer than our own constitution. You will quickly see that most Americans would understand it is one that they could happily live under. I remember the day it was announced, uh, like yesterday, and like so much in the Middle East, with no prior fanfare and read in its entirety, I was listening on the one o'clock radio news. It provoked astonishment in the country. One young man uh, told me, he was a mid-level ministry official, that he was driving home for lunch when he realized what was happening. He pulled off the road, sat and listened, his heart swelling with pride until he started crying. That afternoon, I was called to the office of HM senior minister who was in charge of many things. You can guess who I'm talking about, including the activist American ambassador and asked what I thought of HM's white paper, as it was then called. He was clearly uh, acting on instruction. After some discussion of what I enthusiastically called Oman's new constitution, and being told that the root word in Arabic prevented them from using that word, scholars of Arabic language will understand that nuance better than I do, I suggested the classic German description of their document, the basic law, which I think is what they're still using. Like our own document, it is not perfect, but the rights granted to all citizens of equality before the law, the proto-parliament it announced, and more were there. Um, I would note that HM's most extensive public comments on this document are in Judy Miller's two seminal private interviews with them. They are available on a table at the door. If you haven't read them, you should. 
He gave less than a half a dozen such audiences to real journalists during his 50 year reign. He didn't particularly like the press. So I can commend them both to you. I not only arranged the first one in 1997, but was asked by HM to sit in. He told the same journalist that perhaps his greatest pride as ruler was the progress made by women. I would add that his broad and inclusive approach to governance has led to decades of ethnic and religious peace, which is unique in the region. Kabus did the best job of any Arab leader in including all national groups, including those not of his culture or even religion, in the governance of Oman. For Oman, this means Ibadi, two different branches of Shiism, Sunni, Baluch, and more. These groups now serve at all levels of government, from ministry to military, from the intelligence services to the royal court, from the central bank to ambassadorships, proudly representing the nation that HM built. Let me close by telling you about the suit I'm wearing tonight in Oman's national colors. The Indian silks in my attire were a gift from His Majesty. In many of our meetings, he'd quietly reach behind his chair and present me with silks or stoles or small silver versions of Omani hand handicrafts that he had personally designed for me. He knew our gift rules and never gave me jewelry during the time I was U.S. Ambassador to Oman. I had to report each gift to the State Department, but due to the uniqueness of his offerings, and they were quite personal, I was allowed to keep most of them. But in my early days in the Foreign Service, and as my Southern parents raised me, I worked hard to give him personal gifts in exchange, purchased with my personal funds, which I'd later send to the D1 head site safe to pass on. For a man who collected everything from mechanical jeweled movement displays to rare watches, it was not very easy to do on an FSO salary. So, so I played to his great love of classical music with CDs, uh, books on governance issues I knew he was working on, and unusual coffee table books on rare horse breeds. I haunted bookstores in the West and in London for those. H.M. had been a great equestrian, which you saw in some of the early pictures, and had collected over the years a matched pair of every horse breed on God's earth. They are housed in the royal stables in Salala, which I was honored to visit privately. And I would add that the two very cute Shetlands came from the state of Wisconsin. People went all over the world acquiring these horses for him. I found some really exotic types and knew I'd scored on both music and horse books when I later <laughs> Heard he'd ordered some of the same as gifts for persons on his staff or his ministries. But wait, uh, Sultan Qaboos was also an amateur astronomer and had a large telescope installed at the residence at Beit al Baraka, which he decided to show and demonstrate to President and Mrs. Carter during their historic visit. I learned a lot about the stars that night. I decided to share that last anecdote with you this afternoon as the Carters has sent their wonderful daughter-in-law, Rebecca, to share this evening with us. Thank you, Becky, very much for coming. Sultan Qaboos was a man who led a deeply impactful life, only seeing Muscat for the first time after he became Sultan. How he chose to rule in the following 50 years was a tribute to his intelligence, his culture, and his extraordinary humanity. Power can be a lonely place, but he used his time wisely and well. Sultan Qaboos was an excellent friend for my nation in many ways that you'll never know, and to me personally, over the 25 years that I was honored to know him. We'll not see his like again. But I know you all join me in sending heartfelt wishes for success to his successor, Sultan Haytham, and God's grace in guiding this remarkable nation in the years to come. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ambassador Richard Schmier. Ambassador Schmier is chairman of the board and president of the Middle East Policy Council. He served as a U.S. ambassador to the Sultanate of Oman from 2009 to 2012. He completed his foreign service career in 2014 as deputy Se assistant secretary of state for public diplomacy in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. In 2013, he served as NEA Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary 
Previously, he was NEA Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iraq and Director of the Office of Iraq Affairs. Ambassador Shmir was at Georgetown University from 2005 through 2007, where he published the book, Iraq, Policy and Perceptions. He also has hold in, held in his distinguished career prior diplomatic postings in Iraq, Germany, and Saudi Arabia. Ambassador Shmir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kathleen, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Your Excellency Ambassador uh, Mulgari, other excellencies in the room. A distinguished guest, it's, it's really quite a, a personal honor to be able to be here uh, to talk about someone who I also became friends with, I think not quite to the same level as my uh, colleague Francis, but who's someone who really uh, was a mentor to me and, and, and who really uh, helped me uh, have a successful uh, and extremely interesting time as ambassador in Oman. Uh, as you've already heard tonight, and, and you'll certainly hear more, um, Oman is a unique country, and uh, in many ways, uh, it is uniquely blessed. Uh, and I would say that its most recent blessing has been having at its helm, uh, for almost 50 years, the most enlightened leader of the modern era, His Majesty Sultan Qaboos. The formative elements of Sultan Qaboos's upbringing, which Francis alluded to, uh, are, in my view, a, a key to understanding uh, his approach uh, to Oman uh, in the modern age. His education uh, at the British Military Academy at Sandhurst, uh, his service in the British Army uh, on the Rhine, where I think he was exposed to some pretty outrageous behavior, which probably also affected his uh, thinking. Uh, a year living with a British family in a small town in the UK where he learned about local government administration. An around the world trip uh, following uh, his time in the UK where he visited, among other places, the US. Uh, and then the several years which Francis alluded to where he spent in the Royal Palace in Salala, uh, during which time he immersed himself in the study of Islam uh, and Middle Eastern history, something which I learned a lot about in my conversations with His Majesty. Uh, this background uh, led Sultan Qaboos to emerge as what I would call a polymath that is one with expertise, not only in governance, administration, and military affairs, uh, but in such fields uh, as has been mentioned uh, as history, music, architecture, uh, and others. Uh, his determination to modernize Oman without westernizing it led to Oman's unique development path, including the preservation of its traditional social mores and even its appearance. As Sultan Qaboos himself put it in a 1995 written interview in the journal which my organization publishes, Middle East Policy, to quote, I have borne in mind the need to preserve a careful balance between these two paramount factors, the acceptance of modernity and the retention of old established values. Indeed, not only has Oman retained its traditional look, anyone who has had the good fortune to visit the Sultan Qaboos Grand Mosque or the Royal Opera House Muscat comes to appreciate the good taste that Sultan Qaboos instilled during Oman's transition. To understand the reign of Sultan Qaboos, uh, I believe it is instructive to consider briefly the reign of his father, Sultan Said. Sultan Said had inherited a country deeply in debt and was concerned that this debt severely compromised Oman's sovereignty. Thus, he set as his primary objective retiring the country's debt. But this came at a high price, the lack of even the most rudimentary modernization, leaving to his son, Sultan Qaboos, to jumpstart the Omani development effort. Sultan Qaboos's mother, as was mentioned, was from a Jabali community in the southern Dofar region. By all accounts, she was a remarkable woman with whom Sultan Qaboos was quite close. 
her strength of character certainly infused in him a recognition of the importance of including Omani women in the country's development, which was a hallmark of Sultan Qaboos's rule. Sultan Qaboos's approach in the early years of his reign to pacifying and unifying the country, as well as to launching its overdue effort towards modernization, foreshadowed the wisdom that would come to characterize his long rule. He successfully put down the rebellion in the southern Dofar region that he faced upon his accession, using a combination of military power and conciliation, that is, outreach to entice opponents to switch sides and join him in developing the country, many of whom did, some of whom still continue to serve in the government to this day, and can be very difficult for U.S. ambassadors to deal with, if you know who I mean. Uh, Sultan Qaboos's, you know who I mean. Sultan Qaboos's early international efforts included resolving the many border disputes he inherited. As he himself noted, if a country has recognized and peaceful borders, it, is, it has, in effect, no borders at all and he developed the country's foreign policy described as friend to all, enemy to none. As he steered his country through a fast-paced modernization, Sultan Qaboos had to continually assess the mood and sensibilities of his people. In fact, he was able to quite successfully balance the varied values, goals, and demands of the Omani people while always safeguarding Oman's stability. When circumstances arose, as they did with the onset of the Arab Spring during a time when I was there, Sultan Qaboos responded with several measures to further empower the Omani people, including new authorities to the country's elected parliamentary body, the Majlis Ashura, and introducing municipal elections. Sultan Qaboos's approach to developing Oman's economy was likewise impressive. Over the course of his reign, Oman's per capita GDP grew from $371 in 1970 to well over $15,000 today. Over this period, the country's industrial, industrial production and infrastructure also went from largely non-existent to extensive and modern. Uh, given Oman's less bountiful uh, oil and gas resources than its Gulf neighbors, Sultan Qaboos had Oman lead the region in such enlightened policies as privatizing utilities and monetizing state subsidies. At times, Sultan Qaboos also astutely leveraged external tools such as the process of Oman's accession to the World Trade Organization and negotiations for a free trade agreement with the United States as vehicles to achieve economic modernization in the face of an, at times, resistant merchant community. I think somebody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, perhaps the capstone in recognition of Oman's economic development success under Sultan Qaboos came in the 2010 UN Development Program Report that designated Oman as the country that had achieved the greatest development progress in the preceding 40 years. China came in second. I had the good fortune to engage regularly with Sultan Qaboos during my three years uh, as, as ambassador and came to appreciate the genius and benevolence behind his rule. I recall his animation in describing initiatives for new educational facilities and athletic programs for Omani boys and girls in the wake of the Arab Spring, and his patience and understanding in the face of sometimes self-interested demands by young Omani protesters. While correctly described as having no children of his own, and in fact, it is clear to those who came to know him 
that during his reign, Sultan Qaboos viewed Oman's youth as his children. Sultan Qaboos was often ahead of his countrymen in his vision and efforts to introduce suitable modernization to the country. His decision at the outset of his reign to gender integrate elementary education in the early grades is a good example of his wisdom and courage. It challenged the views of the more conservative elements of the country, but it has had the beneficial result of making Oman a normal country in terms of how the genders relate to each other. As an American, I am also grateful for the wise counsel Sultan Qaboos provided to US officials as the region became more and more inflamed in sectarian strife in recent years. So let me close with a few words about Oman's recent role in regional and international diplomacy. In July 2009, three young Americans were detained, detained by Iranian border guards while, wiking, while hiking in hills near Suleimania, a town close to the Iranian border in the Kurdistan regional government area of Iraq. In September of that year, I arrived in Muscat to begin my tour as the U.S. ambassador to the Sultanate. It was clear from the beginning that the case of the detained hikers was one of young Americans unknowingly being in the wrong place at the wrong time. To gain their release, the U.S. government sought out allies who might be able to assist. As the U.S. ambassador, I raised the issue with Sultan Qaboos. At his direction, Oman began to quietly engage the Iranians on the issue. The Omani diplomat involved quickly discovered that the Iranians were deeply skeptical of U.S. intentions. Now it will come as no surprise to anyone in this room that Oman has very talented diplomats. So, drawing on Omani diplomatic engage in, engagement with Iran, I worked with the State Department to undertake small but symbolic steps, what we diplomats call confidence building measures, to demonstrate U.S. goodwill and to convince the Iranians we were approaching the matter of the detained Americans solely as a humanitarian issue and not to posture politically against Iran. The patient Omani diplomatic effort paid off. First, one of the three, the woman being held, was released, and then the two men were freed. This effort led to the first ever visits by a U.S. Secretary of State to Oman. Secretary Clinton visited Muscat twice in January and October of 2011 to thank Sultan Qaboos for his efforts and also to explore, on behalf of President Obama, possible Omani assistance in addressing the issue of the Iranian nuclear program. The rest is history. I think this anecdote speaks volumes about the wisdom, goodwill, and courage of Sultan Qaboos. He will long be remembered and appreciated by a grateful Omani citizenry and by people of goodwill the world over. As one diplomat who had the good fortune to come to know him, I can say that he inspired me as he inspired so many during his life. He will be missed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Timothy Lunderking. Tim Lunderking is Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Arabian Gulf Affairs and the Near East Bureau at the U.S. Department of State. A career member of the Senior Foreign Service he served previously as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Saudi Arabia and Director of the Pakistan Office at the Department of State. Mr. Langdur King served two, uh, two tours in Baghdad, the first as Senior Democracy Advisor at the U.S. Embassy and the second as the Policy Advisor 
to Lieutenant General Charles Jacoby, Commanding General of Multinational Forces, Iraq. Prior to that, he served as the Economic Counselor and Acting Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait, and was also the Political Counselor at the Embassy in Morocco. Mr. Lender King's other tours in the Foreign Service include serving as Special Assistant to Undersecretary for Political Affairs, as a Lebanon Desk Officer, and as a Watch Officer in the Operations Center. Mr. Langer King also has served in Bangladesh and Syria. He joined the Foreign Service in 1993 after a distinguished career in the refugee field where he held numerous positions with American NGOs and with the United Nations in New York, Sudan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Thailand. Please welcome Timothy Lunderking. Good evening, uh, Ambassador Hunaina, Kathleen, thank you so much for hosting us. It's really an honor to be with you all, distinguished group, friends of Oman here this evening. We were deeply saddened to learn of the passing of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos in January. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo came to know and admire His Majesty personally, and to know that he loved the Omani people, and what a tremendous role that he played as an architect of the friendship between Oman and the United States. I was privileged to join the official presidential delegation that visited Oman last month to pay our respects, to meet and convey the president's sympathy and message of friendship to Sultan Haitham. We arrived in Muscat in a driving rain, morning, flooding, seemed to capture the mood of national mourning. On behalf of the State Department, the United States government, we extend our deepest, deepest condolences to the El Said family, to the embassy here in Washington, to you, Madam Ambassador, your staff, your family, and all the people of Oman and others who have come to know and to admire this very special country. Sultan Qaboos's vision and determination shaped Oman into the prosperous and modern state it is today, and his rule over the last half century has resulted in lasting and positive change in the Sultanate and in the entire Middle East region. Sultan Qaboos was a revered leader and a friend to all nations. The United States deeply valued His Majesty's close partnership in promoting regional stability and security. We especially appreciated his efforts at the onset of the current Yemen conflict to secure the safe passage of all U.S. Embassy personnel from Yemen. We honor his legacy and remain committed to our partnership and friendship with Oman. We really have lost one of the world's great leaders, a visionary whose steadfast leadership embodied sincerity, generosity, tolerance, and deep love of country. His Majesty Sultan Qaboos will be missed not only by the people of Oman, but also by his friends and admirers the world over, including in the United States. His decades as a monarch used oil wealth to pull his country from poverty, made him a towering figure at home, with roads, a port, a university, a sports stadium, and other facilities bearing his name. Internationally, as the longest serving leader in the Arab world, he used Oman's place in a turbulent region next to one of the world's busiest shipping lanes to become a discreet but essential diplomatic player. In a region rife with sectarianism and political divides, Sultan Qaboos championed a policy of independence and non alignment. Ambassador Schmier has recounted how the Sultan intervened to free three American hikers who had been jailed in Iran. Under Sultan Qaboos's leadership, Oman assumed a role akin to a Middle East Switzerland, where foes battling each other elsewhere could meet for quiet talks and try to make peace. Although the country has faced challenges, both foreign and domestic, Western diplomats have marveled at the consistency of the Sultan's policy 2007, he spelled it out in a public statement. We work for construction and development at home and for friendship and peace, justice and harmony, coexistence and understanding and positive, constructive dialogue abroad. That is how we began. That is how we are today. And that, with God's permission, 
is how we shall continue to be. In Oman, Qaboos was beloved and honored for his focus on economic development during the early decades of his rule. He brought in the opportunities for citizens to participate in government. He issued Oman's first constitution in 1996, which institutionalized a consultative assembly and granted universal suffrage to all citizens over 21. In 1994, he welcomed Itzhak Rabin, making Oman the first Gulf state to receive an Israeli prime minister. Two years later, Oman received Shimon Peres. And in October 2018, Qaboos welcomed ben Benjamin Netanyahu on the first visit by an Israeli prime minister to a Gulf country in more than two decades. Omani state television aired footage of His Majesty receiving Mr. and Mrs. Netanyahu. Oman's independent stance has sometimes intrigued and puzzled powerful neighbors. In June 2017, the, the Sultanate remained above the fray when a blockade was imposed by regional actors on Qatar. Qaboos' engagements often went farther afield and far outside those of other Arab leaders. With our newly arrived U.S. Ambassador in Oman, Leslie So, our diplomatic mission in Muscat is continuing to work to build our broad cooperation and to meet our national and multinational national interests in the Middle East with the Sultanate. The United States mission in Muscat seeks to expand our economic partnership with Oman. The U.S. and Oman signed a free trade agreement in 2009. We appreciate Oman's support of many U.S. policy priorities and initiatives, and we look forward to continued close cooperation in the future with the government and people of Oman under the leadership of His Majesty Sultan Haitham bin Tariq. As we mourn the passing into eternity of a great man and a remarkable national and re regional leader, we are honored to mark Sultan Qaboos's memory and his many valued contributions, not only to Oman and the Middle East, but also to humanity and the world. Thank you very much. Our final speaker this evening is Dr. John Duke Anthony. Dr. Anthony is the founding president and chief executive officer of the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, our co-host for this evening's event. For the past 50 years, Dr. Anthony has been a consultant and regular lecturer on Arabian Peninsula and Gulf Affairs for the Departments of Defense and State. He also holds the, extinction, the distinction of being the only American to have been invited to each of the Gulf Cooperation Council's ministerial and heads of state summits since the GCC's inception in 1981. Dr. Anthony serves as a member of the U.S. Department of State Advisory Committee on the International Economic Policy's 12-person subcommittee on sanctions. In May of 2018, he was recognized by the Embassy of the Sultanate of Oman in Washington at their fifth annual Ramadan Iftar celebration. The recognition singled out Dr. Anthony's 53 visits to the Sultanate and underscored his special contributions as an educator and practitioner of private sector diplomacy regarding the Arab countries, the Middle East, and the Islamic world. He has accompanied more than 200 members of Congress, their chiefs of staff, defense, and foreign affairs advisors and legislative and communications directors, together with attorneys general, lieutenant governors, and presidents and directors of world affairs councils on fact-finding missions across the Arab world from Bahrain to Morocco. For the past 25 years, he has also escorted delegations of senior officers to the region for US Central Command. A prolific writer, Dr. Anthony has published widely on the Arab world and specifically on the Gulf, including on the Sultanate of Oman. Please welcome Dr. Anthony. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rodolfo, <coughs> Madam Ambassador El Mogheri, uh, Ambassador Hassan, Ambassador uh, Cook, Ambassador Shmira, Excellencies and uh, special uh, 
invited guest. Uh, your uh, presence here this evening is indicative of what uh, people feel about Oman and Omanis and the late Sultan of Oman, uh, Kabus bin Said bin Tema uh, Abu Said. Allah uh, may his soul rest in peace. I'm not a member of the government or the foreign service, so I have been <coughs> intimately connected uh, with that country's uh, foreign service officers and diplomats um, for the last uh, half century. And uh, that has been a privilege, um, having been invited to become a member of uh, the Department of State. Um, I declined uh, because I would have had to speak the policy and not necessarily speak the truth. And it is easy to speak the truth regarding Oman. One doesn't have to cover up anything or shade it at all. Uh, my remarks are somewhat more personal uh, than professional, though professional uh, uh, they may be. Uh, 54 times now I have been to Oman, and the first time it was as memorable as all the others, uh, 1971, just months after His Majesty had come to power. And you have read, you have heard about the massive, extensive, intensive, uh, pervasive uh, impoverishment uh, of the country. Uh, none of that is an overstatement. If anything, it is an understatement. Uh, just to give you a feeling for this, um, when I arrived, there wasn't a, one hotel, not a single motel, not a pension, not a guest house, not a way station, not a place where one could uh, rest one's head at the end of a day. <clears throat> So, where did I stay? A community of lepers took me in. People found this story incredible, difficult to believe and incomprehensible. How could uh, people with uh, a stunted, disfiguring, uh, horrible disease uh, take in an American uh, into their midst? Uh, share their accommodations, share their food, <coughs> uh, share hymnals on Sundays, uh, those with the <coughs> most uh, stunted thumbs were the ones who held the hymnals, and the ones with the <coughs> most gnarled fingers were the ones who turned the pages. Different in uh, body and the way we looked we were, <coughs> But in terms of how we sang and when and how we prayed, <coughs> we were one. When I first uh, came, Oman was in the throes <coughs> of what became the most complex and longest of Arabia and the Gulf's <coughs> civil insurrections. Um, it lasted for 10 years, 1965 to 1975. Uh, for six of those years, I was involved in this in one way or the other. Uh, first two years, unbeknownst perhaps to many here, was on the side of the rebels. I was the only American allowed into the Marxist-Leninist People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, uh, which was the bastion of support, material and political, rhetorical, organizational, logistical, and otherwise for what was the popular front for the liberation of Oman and the Arabian Gulf. <clears throat> but before Sultan Qaboos came to power in July of 1970, uh, it was called Popular Front for the Liberation of the Occupied Arabian Gulf. They, so they kept the acronyms, but just changed Occupied uh, to Oman. The latter four years were with uh, the British first, and then uh, 
combination of the British and the Omanis, and then the Omanis both. Um, I still have in my closet at home, uh, alongside my duffel bag, because I'm a former soldier since I was 17, <coughs> is my uniform uh, for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Oman and the Arabian Gulf. Uh, my wife and I were asked, would we like to go to the front? We were curiosities. No one believed that an American could be allowed into this Marxist-Leninist uh, country that had expelled uh, all of the American diplomats. They gave the American ambassador 24 hours to leave, uh, the rest of the diplomats uh, 48 hours, and then all of the other Americans in the country 72 hours, and yet here I am. I had a beard in those days <coughs> from an accident where I couldn't raise my hands to shave above my ribs there, but uh, I fit right in in terms of what people could not believe was an American, but they'd lean out the car windows and say, hey, Che, Che, there, because the Cubans uh, were involved, and so were the Bolivians, and so were the Colombians, and so were the Bulgarians, so were the Romanians, so were the Poles, so were the Czechs, uh, so were the Hungarians, uh, the Soviet bloc, and also the Chinese. Uh, of interest, uh, the Soviets uh, did not go out much or practice much. Uh, they stayed inside where it was air conditioned. Uh, those outside were mainly the Cubans and the Chinese and people like myself. Um, going on the government side was a result of the British because the British had remained in the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen after it was independent. Uh, we had been expelled, as I mentioned, but the British uh, had a massive refinery there. And so when they made this decision not to withdraw from the Gulf, that's a misnomer and misleading. Uh, what they did was to abrogate the remaining treaties that dated from the 19th century, by which they were responsible for nine remaining Arabian polities, uh, defense, and foreign relations. So there was no independence movement. There were no strikes. There were no demonstrations. There were no delegations that came with petitions to say, isn't it about time you leave? We would like to belong to the League of Arab States. We would like to belong to the United Nations. Uh, how much more humiliation do you expect us to take? No. There were none of these. There was the opposite. Why are you leaving? We're not asking you to leave. On the whole, we've had a good relationship. It's been, for the most part, a win-win situation. You've benefited, we've benefited, the region's benefited, the world's benefited. Who has not benefited from this? And even one of the neighbors uh, offered to say if it's financial, Tell us how much it costs, we'll pay for it. You can look that up in Hansen's in the parliamentary debates. And I think many of you could guess who that other leader uh, was. Uh, but the British uh, stuck to their decision. So it was the British decision that there should be one American with them as they did this. And uh, our State Department at that time was not in surplus on the empathy front and said, well, who do you have in mind? And they said, we don't have anybody in mind. This is for you. We're passing the baton to you. And so uh, a list of names of American young graduate students were provided to British and these. This is the only time it's worked for my name starting with A. Uh, Anthony, we'll take him. We know him. So this is uh, how it happened uh, there. And in and out of the government, beside the government, consulting here, being with individuals, being in privileged meetings, uh, having clearances at various times, uh, teaching at the Defense Intelligence College, Foreign Service Institute, and elsewhere. Uh, the temptations were, were great uh, to become a, a professional a diplomat. Um, I don't regret it. Um, I like to think whatever contributions I've made, and they would be marginal, remote and back uh, on the other side of the beyond, uh, do have something to do with uh, 
His Majesty Sultan Qaboos. In 1975, he came here not on an official visit, but he met everybody that someone who would have been on an official visit uh, would want to have met, from uh, President Ford, Henry Kissinger, Brent Scowcroft uh, on down. And it was at that time, unbeknownst to me, that uh, he asked if I would come uh, to a reception at dinner with him at the Blair House where uh, presidential uh, guests uh, accommodated, which I did, and to come the next morning for breakfast as well, which I did, at which time he said, I, I have something uh, it's in this envelope. You can open it if you want it. And I did, and it was a sizable check to the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University, uh, because this was where, based on my experiences in Oman and elsewhere, uh, that His Majesty and others made possible, uh, I was privileged to establish the first year-long course on Arabia and the Gulf. Now, we have 2,000 968 universities in America. For the next 25 years, not one single university did the same. Ponder that and the implications of that, given that this is the one part of the planet that we have mobilized and deployed. <coughs> more soldiers, armed services personnel, where we've killed more people, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, other faiths as well, wounded more, displaced more, made more refugees, more, made more orphans, made more widows than any other place on the planet, not once, not twice, but three times in the last 35 years. So if something seems wrong with that picture, it's because something is wrong with that picture. This center here is making a difference. And the ambassador's support for it, Ambassador Hassan's support from New York and the United Nations, where he is the ambassador of Oman's permanent mission to the United Nations. Formerly, we met uh, when I would bring members of the U.S. Central Command officers to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in Muscat. Um, so Oman may be at the edge of the Arab world, uh, but it is in no way marginal to the issues, to the opportunities, to the challenges. 33 Organizations of the United States agreed to stand with us to present the first ever International Peace Award to His Majesty, uh, the Sultan of Oman. And the father-in-law of Rebecca Carter, who's here this evening in honoring us with her uh, presence, uh, agreed to come and present the award. And we had time together as well. And he explained his admiration for his majesty. He said 1979 was one hell of a year. It began with a bang, with the, when the Shah hit the fan in Iran. And um, old whiskers came to power and um, breathed the holy hell on all the Western powers and especially all of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries that were two years away from being established. And this was also when the Grand Mosque in Mecca was seized. It's also when the Shah of Iran was allowed into the United States and 52 American diplomats were seized hostage and kept hostage for 444 days. Uh, these were difficult and trying uh, times. It was also the year of Camp David. President Carter was impressed and pleased and grateful that Sultan Qaboos, along with only the heads of state of Sudan and Morocco, uh, had not broken relations with Egypt over the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, which has stood for the entire remainder of Sultan Qaboos's life. 
uh, before uh, he passed. Uh, what a crowning achievement and monument and legacy that is from your father-in-law. I'm sure he would like to know that you're here and that so many came uh, to know that you're here and to hear his friend, Sultan Qaboos, on it and commemorate it in this way. Of the 33 organizations that agreed to stand with us, Harvard University was one, the Kennedy Center was another, the United States Air Force Academy was another. They all came. It was at the Willard Hotel. Some 18 U.S. government uh, assistant secretaries in rank uh, came for that particular evening uh, to honor His Majesty, and who received the award from President Carter uh, uh, Yusuf Alaway al Abdullah, the Minister of State responsible for foreign affairs. Now, if there is a common theme amongst those who've spoken before me here and His Majesty and the Ambassador, uh, it is the following it is their pursuit of noble objectives. It is their dedication to public service. It is their conviction, uh, their commitments, and above all, their courage, personal courage, political courage, physical courage, and above all, moral courage to deal with the issues in this uh, particular field. It requires a degree of masochism, no doubt. In terms of the distinctiveness of those who you have heard and His Majesty and others who are here this evening, that distinctiveness can be measured in numerous uh, different ways. One of them has to do with uh, perseverance and determination to help end wars and prolong peace. In the process, uh, His Majesty exhibited leadership and vision uh, that translated into his lifting up an entire generation of his people to become number one, as Richard said, Francis alluded to, and Timothy Lender King indicated, number one in terms of the progress on the Human Development Index. One can do a lot of things if one lives long enough, if one has influence, if one has resources, if one is a leader, if one is respected, if one is accepted, if one is trusted. So Panka Bus was all of those and, and more. He succeeded at being the first Arabian Peninsula country to effectively demarcate all of the country's international boundaries. Throughout the Iran-Iraq War of September 1980 to August 18, 1988, Oman never severed relations with either of the parties, Baghdad or Tehran. And this kind of neutrality and mediation and facilitation uh, earned Oman quickly a degree of respect and trust and confidence that many aspire to, what many fall short of. During its own presidency of the United Nations Security Council in Medjib, 25 years earlier, it was not even a member of the United Nations. And more than one Arab country voted against its admission into the United Nations. And it was Oman that led the way to inject a humanitarian dynamic and dimension to the Iran-Iraq war, especially with regard to the provision of medicines and food, pharmaceuticals uh, for the beleaguered in the two countries, and especially later in the 90s with regard to Iraq. Oman was the first Arab country to enter into, for lack of a better word, a defense cooperation agreement. 
except that's what four others were called that were patterned on Omar's. Omar's was 10 years before any of the others. And Omar's was an access to facilities agreement of 1980, worked out with, again, President Carter. Worked out, again, as Francis Cook was mentioning, with the pre-positioning. I remember bringing members of Congress and staff uh, to see the pre-positioned equipment in Oman uh, before either of them became ambassadors. It was a billion dollars worth at the time uh, that put uh, Oman out on the tip of the spear in terms of its identification with what the United States was doing in the uh, region. It worked hard to isolate what the Soviet Union was doing in and to Afghanistan. After all, it was barely an hour and a half flight from Kabul to Muscat, the nearest to the front. But Oman led the way, along with others, to help drive the final nail in the coffin of the Red Army and the implosion of the Soviet Union and the end of international communism following in its wake. Oman played a formative, visionary role in establishing the Gulf Cooperation Council, for which it gets little credit, or far less credit than is its due. Now you read about collective security arrangements of a more innovative, out-of-the-box kind of organization such as an Arab NATO or a Middle East North Africa collective security agreement. Oman voiced these ideas and recommended them decades before they became commonplace in the vocabulary and the lexicon of others there. Oman in the autumn of 1976 uh, hosted all of the representatives of all eight Gulf countries to try to explore establishing a collective security arrangement. It went nowhere, but a lesson was learned, and that was we would be wrong if we had either Iran or Iraq in an organization co-equal with us, given that both seek to blow us away like dandelions in the dust. At the initial founding meeting of the GCC, and Oman had a lot to do with that, even though it was in Abu Dhabi, the last preparatory meeting was in Muscat. I went to that. Everybody was ready to leave at the end because the discussions had been rather bland and Inaki was talking about civil aviation, harmonization of technology and mathematical curricula and the like. And they were looking at their watches and clearly anxious because Iran was angry and Iraq was angry that these six, the last, the more forlorn and forgotten corners of Arabia, were stealing a march in terms of Arab cooperation and collaboration. Kabul said, I would like to speak. And you can almost feel the groan that everything has gone well until now. What is he going to say? He's different from us, like snowflakes and fingerprints no two are the same, and he is more different than the rest of us there. And he said, you could have heard a pin drop. I was lucky to be there, that it's fine for us to debate and discuss and deliberate over these kinds of weighty issues and matters. But our children and our grandchildren will never forgive us if we do not build a wall of defense and security around all that we have accomplished in the previous decade. And not only that, we must link the funding of that, not to others, but to ourselves. So we must link our economic dreams and visions and tactics to our defense dreams, visions, and tactics there. And so it was Oman that put this additional face onto the Gulf Cooperation Council without seeking to take credit. When a person denies taking credit, one can sometimes do 10 times more things than if one insists on taking credit there. With regard to Dofar, this is where he was from, and this made it 
difficult to wind down that insurrection. You had Americans recommending that you do what Sherman did. You just torch the whole area, scorch the whole area, and burn them out. And he would say, where is your empathy on this? This is where I was born and raised. This is my mother's place. Go back to your drawing boards. In the end, it was a small company in Carrollton, Georgia, whose specialty was to produce barbed wire. And His Majesty and the representatives of that company said, you know, we've yet to meet a camel that will walk through barbed wire. And all the supplies are coming in from Yemen by camel. So we are, we are going to string barbed wire up from the coast to the desert and see what happens. None of the camels went through the barbed wire. The guerrillas all had to come and pack their own goods. Takes one camel can take what 10 human beings can do. This helped to wind it down. So did Iran's help, uh, which many people fault Obama for, but none others came to help Obama in the way that Iran did. Jordan did, and Abu Dhabi did to a degree, and Saudi Arabia to a degree. But the greatest help uh, came from the British and from the Iranians. Uh, we Americans were little involved except for the barbed wire. So in closing these rather personal remarks, um, one is uh, tempted to say only the positive and uh, the great things that are undeniable. But at the end of the day, His Majesty was a human being like others, in some ways only more so. And in that regard, he would be the first to say that neither I nor you are bereft of blemish, and none of us are devoid of defect. And you name me the person who's free from flaw. We're all in this together. Thank you. I'm sure the ambassador uh, shares my thanks to all of our speakers for their um, very generous time this evening, comments, recollections of their experiences in Oman and with His Majesty. I know that there are many other faces in this audience tonight who have interacted with His Majesty and have experiences or recollections of their time in Oman. And so I invite you all to continue the conversation. We'll go upstairs, one floor up to the third floor and invite you for some refreshments and food. Thank you very much. Thank you. 